There's an anxiety yep. around your job search. That anxiety is fed by the financial side of it because there's a financial fear. You're running out of money. You can literally hear the clock ticking in your mind. Tick, 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 yep. tick, 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 every tick, second, tick. every second that you're out of work is money going down. Right. And you can feel it. You feel like you're bleeding money. You feel like you're just, just bleeding money. Right. Mm -hmm. And it feels like quicksand. You feel like the harder you struggle, the quicker you sink. A lot of job seekers, what I find is they put their head in the sand and expect, oh, this is just, I don't want to, I don't want to think about it. I don't want to look at it. Look I don't want to know it. I don't yeah. want to see it. That is like totally the wrong approach. Welcome back to another episode of the Who You Know Show podcast, where what you know is important, but who you know can make all the difference in your business, career, relationships, and life. My name is Trevor Houston, and on this show, you'll learn the strategy, grit, and mindset it takes to overcome obstacles so you can level up in your career, recover your cash flow, and live the life of purpose that God intended for you. Don't forget to look at the mic drop moments time stamped in the show notes below. And if you've enjoyed today's episode, make sure to pay it forward, subscribe, and leave an honest review so we can improve. Thanks for listening. My name is Trevor Houston, and please enjoy this episode of the Who You Know Show. Adam is a virtual CFO that translates finances into English. He works primarily with medical practices to make more money. So tell me about your business. You serve the medical industry with their finances. Can you give us a little bit of backstory on that? Absolutely. Yeah. So I, I come in, and instead of them hiring a full-time 40-hour-a-week CFO, they hire me for a part-time schedule. So most of the time, it's about eight to 10 hours a week. I come in, lead all of their financial strategies. So I help them with their budget. I help them with their tax planning. And basically, like I said in my bio, I help them make more money. So pay less in taxes, keep more money in their pocket, invest for the future. That is what I work on. And, and primarily, it's, it's doctors, dentists, orthodontists, physical therapists, chiropractors. So anyone out there that, that's serving patients, and especially in, over the last year, they have needed a lot of help. And so that's where I've been helping people out, making sure that they've gotten through all of this, providing all those services and keeping all their patients safe. Yeah, I was going to say, so uh, obviously in your role, there's, there's a lot of challenges. What do you think your biggest challenge is with your role and, and what are you doing now to overcome it? The biggest one is just all the practices that are closing. So, so, so many of these small independent doctor's offices have had to close because for a while they couldn't do all of the services that they had before. Then they had to institute all of the additional safety protocols and those aren't cheap to be able to reopen in most of the states. And some of them have been open and then closed and open and closed, but it's finding out ways elsewhere to bring in revenue. So it's been moving people to telehealth. It's been yeah. offering additional services that they weren't before. Maybe it's offering subscription-based services instead of just accepting insurance. So there's a lot of those pieces. And whenever there's less money, it's, it's harder to pay a consultant like myself from the outside who was coming in and saying, this is what I cost. This is what I'm worth. I'm going to bring you value. I know I can, but for them to stroke that check every month is a huge hurdle to jump over. No, that totally makes sense. Now, have you always done fractional work like this or what brought about a transition if you transitioned into a role like this? No. So I've been doing this basically since the start of 2020, the five years or so prior to that, I had my own accounting firm. So I was working with small businesses, doing their bookkeeping, payroll and taxes, Late in 2019, I started working with a business coach. And for anyone out there that owns a business, a business coach is an absolute must. I used to be a complete detractor. I was like, why would I hire a business coach? I know what I'm doing. Right, I, <laughs> I got to a business. point where I was stuck <laughs> and I was like, I don't know what it, I'm like. The only way is for someone outside of my company uh -huh. to look in there and say, what's going on? What's your, where are you getting stuck? And over the course of 12 weeks, completely changed my mindset, um, got me on the path to where I am now, where I'm CFO Adam, instead of just being an accountant that was working with people's books and payroll. So I actually sold my accounting practice at the end of 2019 to start the virtual CFO firm. So that was my transition into what I'm doing now. Awesome. How do you relate your, what you do in your profession with, with finances to job seekers and what they're going through? Yeah. So there's a few really important parts. So the biggest one is once they, a job is offered to them, that's when the negotiation starts. 
So they can negotiate their pay, they can negotiate their benefits, they can negotiate their salary. And there's a few huge things that most people don't even think to ask for, but that most companies will say, oh yeah, we'll do that. So professional development is enormous. If you aren't basically guaranteeing that as you're accepting that offer, they may never give you any. So yeah, whether that's oh, wow. going back for college credit, whether that's taking, if you're a salesperson, taking sales courses, going to different events and things like that, that the company will pay for, if you've got it negotiated into your contract, they're going to pay for that. So there, there's that piece. And then while they're in that job search phase, it's going through things like setting a budget. Like if you're only receiving unemployment, there's a cap on how much that can actually pay you. So you need to live within your means, try not to rack up too much debt during that time period so that when you do get back to having a job again and having that salary coming in, that you can theoretically still keep living at that level and then use that additional money to either pay off debt, invest for the future, invest for retirement, invest for a kid's education that you had to put on hold while you were on unemployment. I want to comment to that because, you know, we help people on the financial side too. And, you know, that budgeting is a big part of um, the, the transition. And I know a lot of people don't budget and they haven't budgeted or they don't stick to it up until their transition. But what I want to tell people in, in the audience, I want you guys to think about this. It's not a case where you just have to get through your transition, right? And if you're, if you're not budgeting and you're drilling into your retirement, your nest egg, your emergency fund, like when you start your job, you're starting behind as well, right? Yep. It's not like you're made whole again because you've depleted and you've burnt through your buffer still. So now you've got to build that back. So you're already starting with one arm behind your back. So I guess think about that. That's very important. Yeah. Uh, what you're saying. The thing that I know too is that when we first started the show, I asked scale from one to 10, where are you at? How are you doing? Where are you feeling? How are you? Yep. How are you feeling right now? Yeah. I didn't, there, there were some 10s in there. I got some 25s actually. That yeah, was cool. <laughs> but man, I tell you what, there were some fives, there were some sixes, there were some low numbers in there too, right? A lot of that has to do with fear. There's an anxiety yep. around your job search. That anxiety is fed by the financial side of it, right? Because there's a financial anxiety, there's a financial fear, you're running out of money, you can literally hear the clock ticking in your mind. Tick, 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 yep. tick, 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 every tick, second, tick. every second that you're out of work is money going down, right? And you can feel it. You feel like you're bleeding money. You feel like you're just, just bleeding money, right? Mm -hmm. And it feels like quicksand. You feel like the harder you struggle, the quicker you sink, right? And so there's this fear and anxiety. So what I always recommend for job seekers to do is go get some professional guidance somewhere. I don't care where you go, guys. Yeah, Mark and I do this, but go get it somewhere. Really, for me, it's about impact, right? If, if the words I say right now can help you to go somewhere so that they can take that fear off of your back. Just like you said, it a coach is vital, right? Yeah. A business coach, a career coach for some of you yep. that have not stepped into that realm of looking for a career coach, maybe it's time. We right? have our skill set, but we need help with maybe making a business out of it, making money, or a coach to do a different application of our skill set. 100%. There's people out there that you can get there quicker. That's what a coach is going to do. It's going to help you get to the result faster yep. and in your job search. Oh, the other thing I would say to it as well, a lot of job seekers, what I find is they put their head in the sand. They have that fear. It's the financial worry, the financial fear. They put their head in the sand and expect, oh, this is just, I don't want to, I don't want to think about it. I don't want to look at it. Wanna I don't want to know it. I don't want to <laughs> see it. That is not the right approach. Like totally the wrong approach. It's Ignorance not going to go not away. Bliss. <laughs> no, that's going to hurt you. So, can you relate to any of that? Do you get any of that? Like in what you do? Does like some of these doctors yeah, are they the same way? Do that. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. doctors. Their primary focus is their patients. If they could be seeing patients from midnight to midnight every single day of the year, they would do it. So, a lot of those administrative tasks are things that they let fall by the wayside because they're like, I wanna see more patients, I wanna help more patients, I wanna cure more patients. And so stepping back from that and saying, okay, if I'm not gonna do those tasks, I need to outsource those or insource those to have other professionals take care of those things that they love doing. Like I love numbers, I love accountant, looking at oh, profit wow. and loss statements, all that kind of stuff. 
That's what <laughs> I do every single day. And almost every single client I've ever had, one of the first things they always want to get rid of is all of the accounting tasks. They're like, I don't understand it. I don't know when stuff do, is due. I don't know when to make payments. Right. Please just take it off my plate because I need my stress to go down because I keep getting all these notices in the mail. So it's the same thing you know, when you're on your job search. The notices you're getting in the mail are potentially late payments on bills. Mm -hmm. It's your mortgage. It's your rent. It's your landlord, your phone service reaching out to you and saying, hey, you haven't paid in three months. The tip that I always give people in those situations is call them. They will work with you, yeah, yep. especially oh, yeah, over yeah. the last 12 months. Call those people. And e even if you can't pay the full bill, pay 25 bucks, pay yep. 50 bucks yep. and keep the nego or the conversation going because that will keep them from shutting off your utilities, from 100%. shutting off your phone, yeah. which you need your phone to be able to do your job search. So you need to keep that going. And if you pay something, they're more likely to keep it on because they know that eventually they're going to get that money back mm -hmm. from you yep. once you've got Build a job. A and able to pay those bills. You knew I was going to say that, didn't you? Build a relationship <laughs> with those people. If you can, zero in on somebody and build a relationship in there. What kind of other industry, like, so I find it very interesting what you do, the outsourcing, the kind of fractional work. I don't know if you like that term or not, but are there other industries, like for our audience, are there other professions that can do that, that you've seen? Oh, absolutely. So basically any of your C-suite type roles, uh -huh. I've seen fractional CEOs, I've seen fractional CMOs. Yeah, we got them. And, and everything, done, fractional chief information security officers, chief technology officers, and all the way down to, even in, like in my realm, fractional controllers, fractional bookkeepers, so that, because they don't necessarily need 40 hours a week out of those people, they need 10, but they need the expertise. They need all of that advice that they're going to get from that right. person, but they don't need them filling an office down the hall and sitting there playing solitaire on the computer for 20 hours a week. <laughs> paying them benefits. Yeah, and then there's that too. The cost is obviously less because they're not paying full time. There's no benefits. There's no payroll taxes. It's they can use that office space for somebody else that could be a revenue producing person in their business. So there's a lot of different ways that, you know, using fractional and I'm perfectly fine with the fractional term. That's I use that interchangeably yeah. with virtual. It's very, it's important that people are able to go out and, and look. And for me, I am not a corporate person. I'm not going to go in there, work 40 hours a week for somebody. So I like the flexibility of having four or five different clients that I work eight to 10 hours a week for. Uh -huh. And then I get that variety. I get, because every single business is different, even if they're in the same industry. I'm building those relationships with those business owners and with those medical practice owners is what's really important to me. Quick question for you. If you could turn back time, okay? If you could go back to when you were 18 years old, what would you tell yourself? Oh, that's a good one. Dude, I would tell cool. myself that I didn't need to go into a corporate job coming out of college. And oh. that ah. I have found that entrepreneurship and owning my own business is what I love. Mm. But I was driven all the way through school. You're going to college. And then when you're in college, yeah. you get a corporate job. And then you work in the corporate job and you work your way up the ladder. And I didn't, that didn't fit for me. It didn't fit with my personality. I like to speak out. I like to speak my mind that I know things and I am versed in things and I don't care who's in the room. I'm going to voice my opinion I if that. I have an opinion that's valuable. Boom. And in corporate, yeah. that isn't always accepted. No, it's <laughs> so speak up and speak out. Hey, so I'm curious. You, you said that's what that's the advice you'd have given your 18-year-old self is to own your own destiny, not necessarily to go the corporate route. When did you make that? transition from the corporate world to running and owning your own business and why? So it was, um, it was late 2014. So I started my accounting practice in November of 2014. And the impetus was I got fired from my job. Ah, I was treating that it. That was a God I, thing, by the way. Right. <laughs> God, God said, yeah. bye-bye. This is not your, this is not for you. <laughs> Go on, get out here. Go on now. Yeah. Because my boss felt that I was, treating it basically as my business instead of her business. And so she's basically hit the bricks. So at first I was crushed. I was like, I just lost my job. What am I going to do? How am I going to make money? And 
I had built relationships with all these clients. And so as I started talking to them, being like, hey, I'm not there anymore. I'm not doing that work. They're like, why don't you just do, you were doing everything there. Why don't you start your own business? So that was where my accounting practice started was I literally a lot like, of people go in that direction. So at I, the lowest of the low, like I, I was probably a negative five at that point on yeah, your yeah. zero to 10 scale. And I, the first year was the scariest year of my life. I was like, I don't know how I'm going to pay any of these bills, but I'm going to go after it. And like I said, after five years, I sold that practice off and it'll be able and started a new one. So I love that it yeah. can be done and it can be done and literally bootstrap didn't have a, hardly a penny to my name, started that business and just hustled and worked my ass off. And $10. that was just built it up from nothing to be able to sell it off. Cindy Hen Henry, she's in the comments. She asked if your corporate experience, if you need, you found you needed that uh, to transition into your entre entrepreneurial role. I didn't because, and part of it was when I was in the corporate landscape, I was doing a completely different role. I was on an actuarial track for those people in insurance. And then later on transitioned over to working for small businesses. So moving from the corporate landscape of fortune 500 level. So yeah, it obviously taught me things. And there was obviously things that I learned while I was there that I still use today, but I don't think the track that I've gone on to necessarily had to have that as a prerequisite to get there. Tell us where the listeners can connect with you online. Is there a specific website or? Um, biggest place to find me is LinkedIn. I go by the hashtag CFO Adam, or you can go linkedin.com slash IN slash, and then it's my first and last name. And then my website, which is shown right now is adamk.com. Uh, guys, real quick, before we head out of here, if you could do me a big favor, Adam spent some time with us today. So let's show some love back. Take that screenshot, share that, share uh, that. picture all over social media. I want people like, I want those tags to drive him nuts because all the notifications he's going to get from this audience. I want you just to blow him up. So CFO post it. CFO Adam. Yeah, CFO Adam. And tell him how much you appreciate him and how much you love him coming on the show. And then before you go, one last thing on my ex. Wait, wait, wait. On my ex wait, right wait, now. Wait, wait, wait. Right, right now. All right. all right. Hit that share button. Mash it. Mash it. Mash it. Mash that share button. <laughs> Thanks for listening to the Who You Know Show podcast. My name is Trevor Houston, and if you've enjoyed this episode, consider subscribing wherever you listen and leave us a positive review to help us keep the mics on in the studio. Until next week, that's the show. It's all about who you know. Who you know.